Hey, welcome to Socialism for All. Today's date is December 30, 2021. This video is about COVID, and there's a lot happening right now. The last video that I did on COVID was about a week ago, and in that video, basically I said that Omicron may be the worst phase of the pandemic yet, and everything that's happened in the last week basically seems to be confirming that. It's about five times more contagious than Delta, and... It's just spreading at an extremely rapid pace. Here's the current cases curve. This is from the United States, reported to the CDC at the CDC's COVID data tracker. And basically, there's been 900,000 official cases reported in the last two days. Now, if you factor in all the people who tried to get a test and couldn't get one for one reason or another, and all the people who just tested at home with a rapid test and those results didn't get reported to the CDC. You're looking at, I mean, I think it's fair to say about a million cases, new cases of COVID in the last two days. Now, we know that for the Omicron variant, the R0 number, that's in epidemiology, the number of people that somebody who is infected is likely to infect. Well, that number is about 10 to 12. So do the math this thing multiplies very quickly. So of course, when I say the last two days, uh, there's a lag in reporting. So that's the last two days that we have full or full-ish data for. That would be December 27 and 28. So we don't have the data for the 29th or today yet. So in this video, we're gonna look at a lot of different things. Biden's response, the CDC's response. We're gonna look at why running basically a herd immunity strategy plus vaccines, which seems to be the U.S.'s stance, is a really bad idea because a lot of people who get COVID, even people who are fully vaccinated, and by the way, get vaccinated, I have been urging people to do this strongly, uh, wear a mask all the time when you go out and get vaccinated, get your booster shot. I mean, it's a bit late now, uh, you know, in terms of, you know, eliminating risk. But by all means, get it. And uh, just as soon as you can, hopefully you've already gotten it. But we know that about two out of three people in the U.S. are fully vaccinated. And then about one in three also have the booster. You need everything you can get. They're just I'm, I've been saying this since they said for vaccinated people to take their masks off back in May, which I made a video. I was astounded by this. That was absolutely not indicated by any kind of medical advice whatsoever. In my opinion, that was a business decision, not a medical decision in any way. Again, my opinion. Um, but, you know, that's what we've seen. You know, the vaccines cut down symptoms, masks, distancing, and shutdowns. That is what reduces transmission. So anyway, we're going to look at what are the consequences of just letting everybody get COVID, which incidentally, does not need to be the case. We've seen other countries like China, uh, they've been able to keep their COVID deaths under 5,000. Now, even if they are lying by a factor of 100, and with all the reports on the ground coming in, we have no reason to believe that they're lying, let alone on that level. But even if they were lying by 100, and they were only actually presenting 1% of the actual COVID deaths, that would still be far better than the U.S. is doing and with a much larger population. So keep that in mind every time that you hear people in the U.S. say, oh, there's nothing you can do. Everybody's just going to get... No, no, no. That's a complete lie. And we will look at what's motivating the government to do what they're doing. Anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, why is it a bad idea for everybody to get COVID? Well, the virus lasts in your body. This is not the flu. Uh, the COVID virus, it goes into people's organs, including your brain. We've seen cognitive decline in people who have COVID. Anyway, we're going to talk about long COVID, which about 30% of people get. So this is just basically saying a substantial portion of people, hey, are going to wind up disabled. We don't know who exactly, but for some amount of time, you're going to have chronic pain or muscle weakness or reduced intelligence, or difficulty breathing, or whatever. And hey, there's nothing we can do. That's not true. 
Also, I mentioned vaccines, get them, get boosted, but also get masks and N95s and KN95s, which is basically the Chinese version of an N95. The KN95s tend to have um, side ear loops, while the N95s tend to have two bands that go around your whole head. Personally, I prefer the N95s because of the straps. If you do use the KN95, make sure that it's tight enough on your face by knotting the ear loops if you have to, and consider also using another mask over it. Right now on the screen, there's a number of websites I've put up where you can find N95 and or KN95 masks. I'll read them out for the people just listening. Project95.org, that's project95.org. Acumed.com, A-C-C-U-M-E-D.com. Shop.demetech, D-E-M-E-T-E-C-H dot U-S. Dentech, D E N tecsafety.com, ny-ppe.com, premium-ppe.com, alg.health.com, and progearhealth.com. Again, I'm not affiliated with any of these. I have ordered from some of them, and you should be able to get the masks there. Also, I would just say look for masks that are about a dollar each or less. Sometimes they sell them for like up to two dollars each, but you can definitely find them for more like, I think that Project N95 has like a 50 for $30 deal, and a lot of the others have like basically like a 30 for 30 deal. So let's turn to Biden, first of all. This was kind of the first shocking clip. Biden announces that there is, quote, no federal response to the COVID thing possible. I can't, you can't make this up. And I got to say the last couple of days of collecting materials for this video have just I have been pulling my hair out. To me, this is just the shit hits the fan nightmare scenario. I don't know how else to put it. Look, there is no federal solution. This gets solved at a state level. Okay, so again, that is Joe Biden stating on camera, uh, this is in a call to a governor, that there is no federal solution and it gets solved at the state level. Incidentally, or perhaps not, that is exactly what Trump said earlier. You're going to call your own shots, Trump tells the governors about guidelines to reopen states. This is just what the capitalist class, which rules the United States, wants for the country. And we're going to get deeper into that. Before we get deeper into that, let's get deeper into this clip, because some people have said that Biden, who then went on vacation after giving this little address, uh, was taken out of context. It was not. We're going to show the longer clip now, and then we'll comment on that. Basically, it makes no real sense, the conversation that they have, in my opinion. Welcome, uh, Mr. President. This is actually the 40th time we've convened this group of uh, governors. And we're, in addition, we're in constant one-on-one contact with the governors and their teams. More times than I've seen you. (laughs) Uh, Their leadership on the ground, uh, they are on the front line, as you know, has been essential to the progress we've made so far. I'm going to turn to Governor Hutchinson, uh, who has done an outstanding job as chair of the National Governors Association, leading this group and ensuring we're all working together every step of the way. Over to you, Governor Hutchinson. Thank you, Jeff. And uh, I want to thank uh, all of the White House uh, team for uh, being such great uh, support to the governors. Uh, And I want to thank Mr. President, your address to the nation last week. Uh, Thank you for your comments uh, designed to depoliticize our COVID response. I think that was helpful. As we face uh, Omicron, the governors and your administration must be working together more closely than ever. I particularly appreciate uh, your comments about uh, increasing the supply chain on rapid uh, COVID tests. This has become a real challenge for the governors. And your uh, task force led by Jeff Zients has been responsive and has kept us informed every step of the way. A good example is this last week, uh, I asked uh, for more uh, monoclonal antibody treatments. We received them last week. Still, we have a limited supply, but the responsiveness is uh, very much appreciated. Uh, I would like to give you a glimpse of Arkansas today. Uh, First, hospitalizations are down 
by a half from where they were uh, this time last year, but our Omicron case count and the demand for testing has increased. In Arkansas, we have a, a test to stay a school program that's a pilot in 50 schools. We want to expand that. And right now we have sufficient tests to be able to do that. But we also, as governors, are getting pressure to do more, and the need is great to do more in terms of the rapid test and the availability of it. And so one word of uh, concern or encouragement for your team is that as the uh, as you look towards federal solutions that will help alleviate the challenge, make sure that we uh, do not let federal solutions stand in the way of state solutions and the, uh, the uh, production of 500 million rapid tests that will be distributed by the federal government is great but obviously that dries up the supply chain for the solutions that we might offer as governor. And so just that to brief comment before I turn it over to you, Mr. President, but I want to say personally, I've enjoyed working with you when I was in Congress as head of the DEA, and I appreciate uh, your leadership and thank you so much for giving uh, us the time today to hear from us, but also so that we can hear from you personally about the challenge that we face. So. Uh, Mr. President, the microphone is you. Thank you, President Biden. Hey, sir, thank you very much. Ace. Look, there is no federal solution. This gets solved at a state level. I'm looking at Governor Sununu on the board here. He talks about that a lot. And it ultimately gets down to where the rubber meets the road, and that's where the patient is in need of help or preventing the need for uh, help. Look. Uh, Gov, thank you for uh, for what you're doing. Thank you for the National Governors Association and Vice Chair Murphy across the river. All's, all's well in New Jersey, I assume, Gov. Um, and, uh, Amen, Mr. President. Okay, so enough bullshit. Um, I think it's fair to say that Biden had made his point by that time. So just to recap this, what the governor said, hospitalizations are down, but case count is rising due to Omicron. Yes, well, obviously hospitalizations lag. However, what we can see in England and even in some places in the U.S. is that the hospitalizations are by now catching up. So, And that's one thing I want to really emphasize here. With something that is moving at as fast a velocity as Omicron is, just a few days of bad policy and mistakes can rack up just inestimable damage that you can't easily recover from. So this thing is moving fast, and some of the criticism here, I mean, first of all, I don't really see any signs that they're doing a lot of the things that they need to be doing at all, even too slowly. But speed is a factor, and that's part of the criticism here. Anyway, so hospitalizations down, well, you know, get back to me in a week or two and we'll see where things are at then. Anyway, as far as what he said about Biden doing the 500 million rapid tests, we covered this in the last video. There's 330 million people in the United States. Assuming that 80 million people don't want one for some reason, that leaves 250 million people. So that's basically two tests per person. That's woefully inadequate. It, I mean, that's a bare minimum start to cover you for to cover the country for like one week, I mean, and that's you know there's plenty of people who need to test more um, because even if you're vaccinated, you can spread it. We're gonna get into all of that more once we get to the CDC's revised guidance on quarantining and isolation. That one is mind blowing. But anyway, what the governor says is that uh, the federal government doing 500 million tests quote dries up the supply chain for what the states might be offering. This one is a real head scratcher to me because, correct me if I'm wrong, but the states and the federal government serve the same population. So essentially, this is gonna wind up helping the same people in the end. That didn't make a lot of sense to me. And then of course, Biden comes back with, there is no federal solution. And then, you know, he's just sort of doing this little meet and greet. How you doing over there? You know. So that's it. Now let's go back to what Biden said in 2020. The, the entire Joe Biden 2020 Twitter feed, by the way, is a goldmine of false promises. But here's what Biden said last year. This was November 13, 2020. So 
about 13 and a half months ago. I am alarmed by the surge in reported COVID-19 infections, hospitalizations, and fatalities. This crisis demands a robust and immediate federal response, which has been woefully lacking. Actually, if you go back a little further to August 2020, we have this one, August 7. The truth is that President Trump could have acted months ago to curb this pandemic. It's obvious he still hasn't learned his lesson. He continues to ignore the warnings of health experts, and we're all paying the price. This is coming from somebody whose CDC, back in May 2021, told vaccinated people that they could take their masks off, when we know very well vaccinated people, the vaccine, again, great for reducing symptoms. Get it. It's going to cut your odds of winding up in the hospital way down. But, you know, that's good for averting, like, worst-case scenario. You still don't want COVID. Uh, you can get a pretty severe breakthrough case, and, again, it can result in all kinds of symptoms of long COVID. You don't want that. It's not like, oh, I have the vaccine. I can get COVID as many times as I want. That's really bad thinking. And again, the vaccine, it cuts down your symptoms and it does reduce your viral load, particularly after the first week, but not so much in the first five or six days. So people who are vaccinated definitely are still contagious and can spread it. So that was, in my opinion, horrible advice. And where are we now? Well, they still haven't reintroduced mask mandates, even with Omicron. What is going on? According to Biden, this is as of December 28, 2021, here's where we stand one year in. Nearly 6 million new jobs, a record for a new president. Unemployment down to 4.2%, three years ahead of predictions. Yeah, nobody's filing because you can't get benefits because you cut them. Applications for new small businesses up 30% and the fastest economic growth in nearly 40 years. America is on the move. This is delusional. This is on a day where we just logged in two days a million new cases of COVID, roughly. 900,000 official. We can estimate that there are many more unofficial. What is going on? It actually gets worse. I mean, you know, on the, on the move tweet, we have just kind of a psychotic denial of reality. Here, it takes another form. This one's from yesterday, December 29, 7.56 p.m. Omicron cases are on the rise, but it's clear that vaccines and boosters are making a difference. Vaccines and boosters help to prevent severe illness and death. If you haven't already, go get your vaccine and booster. Now, that's true, but then what do they do? They give you a extremely misleading infographic, which many people have been pointing out, look at what they have. COVID-19 cases versus deaths last seven days. So you have the daily cases and they use the seven day moving average, not the actual per day case count. Note that first of all. So this is really smoothed over. Then look at where the y-axis that goes up the left side of the graphic starts. It doesn't start at zero. It starts at 125,000 cases. Okay. Again, just for comparison, here's the real curve of not, I mean, it has the seven-day moving average on there. That's the red line. But here's the actual cases. It's shooting up at an alarming rate. Then the deaths. Uh, this, again, doesn't start at zero. It starts at 2,100. So they're trying to say that deaths are down. Well, it's trending up right there in the thing. And what do we know about the deaths curve? Well, think about it logically. Do you die uh, before you get COVID or after from COVID? Obviously, time runs forward. So you get the case first, then the deaths lag by two weeks or so. So obviously, the cases are going to shoot up first, and the deaths are going to take time to run behind that. So they're being incredibly misleading here. Yes, the vaccines and boosters do improve your odds, but... That's not what's being reflected here in the graphic. Um, there's no... Anyway, I mean, if you wanted to actually tell that story, then you could say, here's what the death-to-case relationship was previously, and here's what it is now. That's not what they're doing at all. They're just misleading people. So again, where they even acknowledge this, uh, it's, it's, again, psychotically distorted. Now, before we go to the CDC, there's, uh, there, honestly, there's so much... I'm trying to cover in this video, 
and I'm so drained, it is so difficult to like try to stuff everything in without missing anything. Uh, but let's talk again for a second about leaving it up to the states and, you know, there's no federal solution. Well, what did we learn early in 2020 when the shutdowns were still in place? We learned that even a few states not taking it seriously and allowing big hotspots to build up, I'm thinking of Florida, I'm thinking of Louisiana, at times New York and California, although I think that was more early on. Anyway, we found that if you let even just a few places build up a huge amount of virus spreading, then it's going to get out into the other states that have a more serious shutdown going. And so you never really get it under control because you have this rotating Petri dish jumping from state to state, this kind of roving hotspot that then is capable of infecting other places. And indeed, the United States served as this for the rest of the world on, you know, one level of scale up, uh, you know, even a few countries serving as big virus incubators can then go on to infect entire other countries. So let's look at the states. How are the states doing? Here's a snapshot from Texas, which currently has a test positivity rate. That is the percentage of all COVID tests that are done that come back positive for COVID-19. December 26, Texas's positivity rate is 21.3 more than one in five people going for a test, it comes back positive. And I just want to remind people, putting that figure in context, on May 12th, 2020, the World Health Organization, WHO, advised governments that before reopening, this is when the like global shutdown was happening, that rates of test positivity should remain at 5% or lower for at least 14 days now, that was before the vaccine, which mitigates a lot, but not all, of the symptoms of, you know, being COVID positive. But still, they were saying that you needed to have 5% or lower test positivity for two weeks in order to come out of a shutdown. Now, we got Texas, for example, being at 21.3. But, you know, well, that's Texas. Surely, you know, not everywhere is, oh. So here we have the Johns Hopkins Coronavirus Resource Center, and this is their page about test positivity. Well, the abbreviations are small, but New Jersey, Washington, D.C., Pennsylvania, Kansas, Wisconsin are all over 40 percent, with New Jersey being over 80 percent test positivity. More than four out of five people going for a COVID test come back positive. How many states are under the 5% number, which is what you used to need to come out of shutdown? Well, Alaska, Montana, Wyoming, and then there's no data for Maryland. So basically three states. Everything else is above 5%, with many over 10%. You can see starting around Utah, Indiana, Kentucky, Connecticut, New York, Louisiana, it just goes up and up and up. So this is out of control. Like I said before, they're basically running a herd immunity strategy, just plus vaccines, to mitigate some of the more severe symptoms and outcomes. But not for everyone. You can get a breakthrough case. They can be quite severe. And um, this is what we're doing. Also, herd immunity was denounced long ago as being ineffective Let's throw something else in there. If you get one strain of COVID, for example, Delta, it does not necessarily confer immunity for other strains. We have seen, and it's on the screen, that convalescing or recovering from Delta confers almost no immunity to Omicron. So you're just going to keep getting it. And again, I mean, there was something trending yesterday about a guy who got COVID nine times, talking about, oh, I have natural immunity. Look, just because you didn't die doesn't mean your body is not being affected by it. Stick around or jump to the end of this video for a discussion of long COVID and the many risks of just repeatedly getting infected by this thing. Death is not the only negative health outcome possible. 
I mean, just seriously, we're basically back to the beginning of the pandemic, except this time with supplementary checks from the government and shutdowns and mask mandates taken off the table. Speaking of shutdowns, before I move off of Biden, here is what Biden said on the campaign trail. It didn't make any sense last year, and it didn't work in practice. I'm not going to shut down the economy. I'm not going to shut down the country, but I'm going to shut down the virus. I'm going to shut down the virus. I'm going to shut down the virus. What I would say is I'm going to shut down the virus, not the country. And so, folks, I will take care of this. I will end this. I will make sure we have a plan. Now that you're president and you're saying there is nothing we can do to change the trajectory of the pandemic in the next several months, what happened to two months ago when you were talking declaratively about I am going to shut down the virus? Well, I'm going to shut down the virus, but not. I never said I'd do it in two months. I said it took a long time to get here. It's going to take a long time to beat it. You ready? Look, there is no federal solution. There is no federal solution. And I understand you guys may have some questions. I think we're going to clear the press first. Well, what do you get in a situation like that where there's just absolutely no structural protection for people? Well, one thing a lot of places will close on their own. So you get a partial shutdown from that. Then a lot of people just won't show up because they're not willing to risk their health. So you get a partial shutdown and slow down from that. And then you get a lot of people who are sick and can't go anywhere. So you get a partial shutdown from that. So basically you wind up with a de facto shutdown without preventing any illness or death. On that note, let's now turn to the CDC, which this week revised its guidelines. This is astounding, this one, on quarantine and isolation protocols, which basically they just cut in half. So you see on the screen there a tweet from Ben Siegel, quoting the Associated Press out of New York, U.S. health officials on Monday cut isolation restrictions for Americans, U.S. Americans who catch the coronavirus from 10 to 5 days, cut it in half, and similarly shortened the time that close contacts need to quarantine. This was retweeted by Beguiling Bug, who added, Yeah, the studies behind the 10-day quarantine showed that 9 days was the max that anyone carried live viral load, and 5 was just when you're most contagious. So they're basically saying that on days 5 through 9, You're still likely contagious, but it's fine. Well, it isn't fine. Here on the screen, we have, again, a chart. I got this from Eric Feigl-Ding on Twitter, excellent epidemiologist, showing that whether you're vaccinated or not, and the unvaccinated is the red line, and the green is uh, the vaccinated, in the first five or six days, it's roughly equal the viral load that you're carrying, then in vaccinated people, the viral load tends to drop off a lot faster because the vaccinated person's body is trained to fight the virus, so it disposes of the virus more rapidly. But in the first few days, it's equivalent. Now, compare this to the UK. Here is Feigl Ding again. Dear CDC, the UK requires not just one test, but two negative COVID-19 tests in order to exit isolation before 10 days. But somehow, a five-day exit with no negative tests is okay in the U.S.? American exceptionalism does not apply to a pandemic virus. P.S. Asymptomatic cases can still spread the virus. Yeah. But that's not even the worst part. So they released that on the 27th, Monday. So here's the media statement from the CDC, which, as we'll get to, you can see on the right side of the screen, They quietly, without announcement, revised this to make it even worse yesterday, the 29th. So, CDC updates and shortens recommended isolation and quarantine period for the general population. Media statement for immediate release, Monday, December 27, 2021. Given what we currently know about COVID-19 and the Omicron variant, 
CDC is shortening the recommended time for isolation from 10 days for people with COVID-19 to five days if asymptomatic, which being asymptomatic doesn't mean anything with regard to contagiousness, followed by five days of wearing a mask when around others. And note, so basically they're just saying uh, you'll be contagious probably, but just wear a mask around others. So they're literally telling contagious people to go out this is insane. Uh, also note that on wearing a mask, they don't specify N95 or anything. Cloth masks, they're better than absolutely nothing, but they really don't do much, if anything, against aerosols. So they'll stop some, like, spittle from spraying, but they're not good masks. Wear an N95 or a KN95. We don't even have mask mandates, let alone the government giving out N95s to people like they should be doing and mandating their use. They say, oh, yeah, and you'll be contagious, but wear a mask and, you know, maybe cross your fingers and throw a penny into a wishing well, I guess. Continuing, the change is motivated by science, hmm. demonstrating that the majority of SARS, coronavirus 2 transmission, occurs early in the course of illness, generally in the first one to two days prior to the onset of symptoms and in the two to three days after. Therefore, people who test positive should isolate for five days and if asymptomatic at that time, they again, that means nothing. They may leave isolation if they can continue to mask for five days to minimize the risk of infecting others. What would actually minimize the risk better is just continuing to isolate, but they're changing this, and we'll get to why. Uh, the why is, well, it's basically been admitted at this point. We will have a clip on that. But before we do that, look at what they changed it to. This was bad enough, and then last night they go and, like, quietly change it. Now it says, given what we currently know about COVID-19 and the Omicron variant, CDC is shortening the recommended time for isolation for the public. People with COVID-19 should isolate for five days and, and this part is new, if they are asymptomatic or their symptoms are resolving without fever for 24 hours. Follow that by five days of wearing a mask, went around others to minimize the risk, of infecting people they encounter. So, in other words, <laughs> you can be asymptomatic or you can still be symptomatic, but as long as your fever has gone away, you're good. This is like, I mean, first of all, it's unclear advice. Second of all, this is gonna result in a lot of COVID spreading, a lot. So why did they do it? They're the CDC, right? Like. Centers for Disease Control, not Disease Spread. Well, here's what Fauci said, and he's not with CDC, he's with the NIH, but this was his take. Uh, let's begin with these new CDC guidelines. Uh, why is the CDC now changing these uh, recommended uh, isolation times for people who test positive for the virus uh, but don't have symptoms? I, I guess the simple question is why now? Well, the reason is that with the with the sheer volume of new cases that we are having and that we expect to continue with Omicron, one of the things we want to be careful of is that we don't have so many people out. I mean, obviously, if you have symptoms, you should not be out. But if you are asymptomatic and you are infected, we want to get people back to the jobs, particularly those with essential jobs, to keep our society running smoothly. So I think that was a very prudent and good choice on the part of the CDC, which we spent a considerable amount of time discussing, namely getting people back in half the time than they would have been out so that they can get back to the workplace doing things that are important to keep society running smoothly. So there you have it. It's about forcing people back into work. We are back to the beginning of the pandemic, except we are all apparently essential workers now, except the virus is far more contagious and severe than it was initially. And they're playing with fire. There's no other way to put it. Everyone I saw who had an opinion on this was critical. And that included normies who do not run a communist YouTube channel. I mean, this is a widespread what the fuck moment. But it does seem to be true. I mean, Fauci has no reason you know, that I'm aware of to say otherwise. Then we have this story from December 21st. Reuters, David Shepardson reporting, headline, 
Delta CEO asks CDC to cut quarantine time for breakthrough COVID cases. So, in the last video, we covered how the Southwest Airlines CEO, who was COVID positive at the time that he was talking to Congress, was sitting there coughing and telling Congress, we don't need masks on the airplanes. It's fine. Just, yeah, you know, let everything go back to normal. Now we have the Delta Airlines CEO was just lobbying at the CDC for them to cut the quarantine time. And that's exactly what happened. What is the deal? I mean, I know that this is political. I know that it's capitalism. I know that they want their profits up. They can't do this. And I don't mean they can't do it because of, you know, there will be a strong political response. I mean, I hope there is. I hope that there is, you know, 2020 level demonstrations again against this. But you can't do this because of Omicron. Like, it's going to wipe out the country in terms of what I said before. You're going to have a de facto shutdown because some places will close voluntarily. Other places will close because workers won't show up. And then still more places will close because the workers would come into work but they're like deathly ill and have to stay home or they're hospitalized or their kids got it. That's a whole thing. We're going to cover that in an even later section of the video. Kids, kids under five cannot get vaccinated and they have the lowest levels of hospitalization so far, but there have been like infant deaths from COVID and schools are set to reopen. New York City schools, for example, are just planning on going back to normal in just a few days, January 3rd. This is going to be a level of disaster, just unmitigated catastrophe. I don't even know, like, I don't know how. The only thing that can save this is if the teachers unions have a strike and refuse to show up. That's the only way. I mean, this is marching kids off to suicide. And I'm not saying every last kid is going to die from COVID. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is you're going to get rampant, unchecked spread of a highly contagious and very potentially severe virus with wide-ranging developmental effects and all kinds of things. And the kids are going to take it home to their parents and grandparents and their younger siblings who aren't of school age yet, who have not been vaccinated and it's going to spread and spread and spread and mutate and mutate and mutate. Remember, Omicron wasn't here until it was. And then it's too late to do anything about it. So the CDC took a lot of heat for this, and the head of it, Rochelle Walensky, then went on TV trying to defend it. And I'm just going to preface this by saying that Walensky was said to have been a pretty strong COVID warrior before she joined the Biden team. Then... I mean, it was her CDC that was relaxing the summer camp restrictions and the, uh, you know, mask off guidelines and all that. Well, here she is again. Dr. Rochelle Walensky is the director of the Center for Disease Control and Prevention. Dr. Walensky, good morning. Thanks for joining us. We want to start, if we can, with the CDC's recent decision to cut that isolation period in half. Given that you and other public officials have acknowledged that it wasn't exclusively science, but also those possible staffing shortages that played a role in this decision, should Americans feel safe? Good morning, Peter. Thanks so much for having me. So we followed numerous areas of science in making this important decision. One, of course, was how the virus behaves. How much virus do you still have that you could potentially transmit after five days? And we generally know that most of your transmission potential happens in those one to two days before you have symptoms and those two to three days after. So by the time five days of isolation has occurred, you probably have about 85 to 90 percent of all of your pr transmission potential behind you while you've been in isolation. Importantly also to that decision was where we are in the epidemiology of this disease, skyrocketing case numbers, as you have noted, we anticipate they could get even higher. And many people are asymptomatic or only mildly symptomatic, especially those who have been vaccinated or boosted. And so they may very well not be able to or willing to comply with 10 days worth of isolation. So this was really a way to tell people, make sure you isolate in those first five days when you're max 
maximally infectious. And then, of course, wear a mask for those last five days to make sure that you don't spread anything that might be left over to others. Well, Dr. Walensky, let's put this into real terms. Let's say I'm sitting on an airplane. I'm sitting next to someone who is masked, but who tested positive for COVID six days earlier. Should I be concerned that I could be exposed to COVID? You know, during uh, certainly in those airplane corridors, you are wearing a mask, the person next to you is wearing a mask, and if, the, if both of those are true, as they should be in those airplanes, then I would say your risk of transmission in that situation is really quite low, even if that person has a little bit of a tail end of virus. And Dr. Walensky, other public health officials have criticized these new guidelines, saying that they should include a negative test, that that should be necessary for someone to be able to leave that isolation period. Why is that not included in the new guideline? Yeah, really important question. I'm glad you raised this. So what we do know is that um, the PCR test after infection can be pos positive for up to 12 weeks. So that is not going to be helpful. Um, you're not going to be transmitting during all of that period of time. We've seen that in study after study. So then the question is, well, why not do an antigen test at five days? We do know some people at five days will be negative and still be able to transmit. We also know that some people will be positive and still be able to transmit. So that antigen test was actually not authorized for this purpose and it's not it's information would not be useful regardless of what the antigen test said we would say you still need to wear your mask for five days well just following up on the antigen test there's new data from the fda which shows that the results may not be as accurate as initially thought so if people are taking those at home tests should they have confidence that they're accurate Right, so we do know that the antigen test may not perform as well as it had for prior variants, the alpha variant and the delta variant, but it's still picking up quite a bit of um, infection. So a really, really helpful tool. But what we would reiterate and is also in our guidance is that if you um, have a negative antigen test and you have symptoms, then you should go ahead and get that PCR test. And those antigen tests are really helpful for things, as you just noted, on tests to stay in school, where we're getting an antigen and test every day or every other day or where they're using them in higher education to screen uh, students every several days, that's when they perform really quite well as well. And, and Dr. Walensky, as you know well, the CDC has been criticized for mixed messaging throughout the course of this pandemic, whether it's on masks or on boosters. Why should Americans trust the CDC? My job right now is to take all of the science and the information that we have and to deliver guidance and recommendations to the American people that is adapted to the science at hand. This pandemic has given us a lot of new and updated science over the last two years, and it is um, my job to convey that science through those recommendations, and that is exactly what we are doing. Dr. Walensky, we always appreciate your time and expertise. Thank you very much. So here's what I have to say about that video. I mean, in light of what we were looking at earlier and everything else, she did a good job of sitting there and sounding reasonably confident and like she knew what she was talking about. My response is, remember this video a month from now when none of this will have worked. I don't think that this strategy is going to work. I think it's going to fail and fail in a big way. I think that we're going to have a level of spread and contagion that basically is like worst case scenario of, you know, going back to the beginning of the pandemic when everybody was imagining what is this going to be like actually, you know, what are the effects actually going to be? I think that this is going to be far worse than it has been at any time in the last two years, which I have to say, I am so angry about this. I've been super careful for the last two years. Um, I have really taken a lot of lengths trying not to get COVID. I think I may actually have had it twice. Um, I didn't have a positive test ever, but I got knocked on my ass by something that I've never had anything like it before. But basically, I had to lie down on the couch at like four o'clock every day and I could not get up basically for the rest of the day and this lasted for several weeks. I had this twice. The first time I didn't get tested, uh, I was just staying in anyway and it was winter and I just didn't want to go out. 
and I was really sick. <laughs> like, I mean, it was more fatigue than I've ever had from anything else ever. And, um, you know, I had other symptoms, achiness and whatever else, but I was really knocked out. And then I got the exact same thing again this past summer. It incapacitated me for weeks and, you know, I didn't wind up in the hospital. So therefore it was considered quote mild, but again, I was incapacitated. Like I really couldn't do much of anything for weeks on end. I had to save all my energy, like, or use all my energy early in the day because I knew when mid afternoon, late afternoon rolled around, I was done for the rest of the day. Like I'd have to lay down on the couch and after about an hour of resting, I'd feel better. And then I'd get up and do something. And five minutes later, I'd be right back to where I was. Have never had this in my life before. Anyway, I have been trying my damnedest to like avoid all of this and to just watch the federal government piss away all of the work and all of the sacrifices that everybody has done. I mean, that's sort of my story. I mean, I've known people who also have gotten COVID and died from it. But ev I mean, everybody has their story. I'm not trying to like put mine above anybody else's. Everybody has their story with this. We have all given up a lot. And now after two years of struggling through this, to just watch them say, well, everybody just has to go to work now. It's literally the most contagious strain of this virus that we've seen so far. And it's maybe 10% milder than Delta, which is not saying much. And, um, but you know, you just got to go to work and 2022, everybody, every, you know, back to normal, totally back to normal. There's no checks, there's no shutdowns, there's no nothing. Now, I have heard rumblings online that there might be some kind of a shutdown. I don't see how they can not do one. Because like I said, you're going to get one anyway, just because people are going to be trying to avoid this virus or they're going to get hit by it and they're going to be taken out of action. People won't be able to do things whether they want to or not. But really, really unbelievable. And it's been a real slog for me to get through this video, just watching this happen. And it's so avoidable. Um, they're just not doing any of the right things. I mean, I guess the free vaccine, that's one good thing. At this point, though, that's about it. And that's really kind of the only thing that they're running with. I mean, telling people, oh, yeah, you can sit next to somebody who just got COVID six days ago on an airplane. This is going to blow up. I, I just, I, like I said, they're playing with fire. They have to know it. That's why I'm saying, like, I know that they need their profits and whatever. They must need them real bad. Going back to the tweet that I started this thing off with, I wrote, I just want to say again, I think Omicron may be the beginning of a serious freefall for an already severely weakened USA. This is a buckle up moment, in my opinion. Whatever you've been putting off in terms of organizing, do it now because we're probably going to need it very soon. And the thing I want to underscore there is the already severely weakened USA. We've already been dealing with this, quote, labor shortage. Things are already economically not at their best. I think that the effects of Omicron are really going to take things to a place where this really may be the limit of the system's capacity to, you know, handle this kind of shock. What's kind of freaking me out the most right now is that, well, I'd say it's two things. Number one, I think that the policies that they're implementing now or not implementing are going to result in a pretty chaotic couple of months coming up just due to the effects of the virus. And, you know, everybody's trying to plan their life and have some kind of order and, you know, just take your life in a particular direction. This really, I mean, it's like all bets are off for the next few months, for real. Then, the fact that their response here is like, what, like I, I never would have predicted what they're doing now. Like, literally just throwing their hands up. It's beyond the pale, and it's 
like I never would have expected that they would go this far. I mean, it's like they're not even trying to save their own system. It's bizarre. So you get a very chaotic forecast on the two fronts. One, the virus and the natural effects of that. Two, clearly we can't, <laughs> like, what's the government going to do? I don't know, because it looks like they're throwing their own system away. So it becomes very hard to predict what they're going to do. So I, I don't know, like, what to say for the next five or six months. Um, you know, it, it's deeply concerning in a lot of ways. You know, this is the same CDC that out of nowhere was like, take your masks off. And everybody's like, what? What are you talking about? Uh, and of course, everybody went along with it in terms of people who were in positions of authority. The mask mandates came down. People weren't like, no, this is bad advice. What the hell are you doing? But it caught everybody by surprise that they did that. But then again, you know, look at this. Speaking of things that don't make any sense, some of you will remember that the CDC changed how they collect breakthrough data and how they count cases. This is a story from MedPage Today, written by Sophie Putka, dated December 29, 2021. Headline is, Wondering how the CDC collects breakthrough data? Get in line. Agency has some state and cohort data, but consistency remains out of reach. So just commenting, this is how the CDC has been handling things for a long time now. Um, Continuing with the MedPage story, on November 11, 2021, MedPage Today reported on the CDC's lag in updating breakthrough infection data. As part of our review of the year's top stories, we follow up on what the agency has changed since our initial report and why their methods are still so confusing. Comment. So it's almost like the CDC is trying their hardest to obfuscate and just try to sell people on this back to normal thing, which now maybe you could pull it off somewhat with Delta and like, oh yeah, background noise, there's 2,000 cases a day, but hey, that's the new normal. Now with Omicron, I, I think that they're still doubling down on this. Everything's fine, folks, and it's just less and less credible. So moving on with the article, in mid-November, the CDC created a tracker for rates of COVID-19 cases and deaths by vaccination status. That is the thing that I showed the case count from earlier. After announcing in May that it would only focus on collecting data from states on severe breakthrough cases, referring to those that resulted in hospitalization or death. Comment. So that means if it didn't result in hospitalization or death, and it was in a vaccinated person, they didn't count it. So when we're looking at the number of cases, that's what we're talking about. It's only unvaccinated cases or vaccinated that resulted in hospitalization or death. Vaccinated cases that somebody missed work for a month or whatever did not get counted. Continuing. The need for clear and timely data on breakthrough cases has become ever more evident but so have the challenges the CDC faces in compiling and presenting that data. Quote, There are a lot of things to say about what's going on with CDC data beyond the fact that it's late, said Jessica Malati Rivera, MS, an infectious disease epidemiologist who led science communications for the COVID tracking project and is now working with the Rockefeller Center to track Omicron and breakthrough cases. Quote, It's the type of granularity that has kind of always been missing and that we needed. What has changed? Since MedPage Today reported an almost 10-week lag in the CDC data, the agency has made a number of changes to its tracker page. Case and death data were updated a few times. Although the date that changes were made isn't listed, by late November, data was available through October 2 instead of September 4, and by December 18, they had added cases through November 20 and deaths through October 30. More states have also been added since October. On December 18, the CDC changed the tracker page 
to state that 27 jurisdictions now are providing their data, covering, quote, over half of the country, which is up from 16 states, or, quote, over a third of the U.S. population. However, Malati Rivera was skeptical. Quote, that's just not how the distribution of COVID-19 has ever gone. You cannot have representative data using only 27 jurisdictions. You just can't. The agency added language about its methodology, noted that updates will be monthly, and explained that deaths are counted for the date of testing positive, not the date of death. It also modified the tracker to reflect breakthrough infections after booster shots as Omicron takes hold. It notes that those with booster shots had the lowest case rates. This comes as the CDC faces new challenges in communicating the need for booster shots and confusion about whether vaccines really work. But Malati Rivera said that, without being based on representative data, quote, it's not useful data. CDC response. MedPage today reached out to five current and former CDC employees and members of the COVIDnet team for more detail on the breakthrough infection data. None were able to comment. A public affairs representative for the CDC simply referred MedPage to the tracking tool and to COVIDnet for breakthrough hospitalizations and provided information already available on agency websites. But at a December 10 press briefing, Serena Marshall with Now This News, who also hosts the Track the Vax podcast from MedPage Today and Everyday Health, asked CDC Director Rochelle Walensky, MD, MPH, that's the woman in the video, whether the agency planned on changing how it would be managing and tracking breakthrough cases, noting that there had been a push from the medical community to provide data in real time. While Walensky did not answer the question, she explained that breakthrough cases are tracked by, quote, passive reporting, or voluntary reporting, acknowledging that this does not provide a full picture. She followed by saying that the CDC has been following, quote, many different cohorts to monitor breakthrough infections, including groups of healthcare workers, patients in long-term care facilities, and in healthcare systems like Kaiser Permanente and Intermountain Health. These cohorts likely include a handful of networks that function essentially as long-term observational studies, some with as few as 8 to 11 sites, Vision, COVIDnet, Ivy, NHSN, and Heroes Recover. Quote, the major problem overall is basically selection bias. Stephen Morse, Ph.D., of Columbia University Medical Center in New York City, wrote in an email to MedPage today, quote, Essentially, all of these data come from hospitalized patients or those seeking medical attention, such as in the ER. So, it will be biased toward the symptomatic individuals, but not necessarily in a systematic way. Walensky said that the more than 20 public health departments providing data likely referring to states, gives, quote, a really accurate view of breakthrough cases. But beyond the acknowledgement that 27 state health departments who, according to the CDC, quote, regularly link their case surveillance to immunization information system data, are included in the tracking tool, much remains unclear. The CDC hasn't made it easy to understand whether or not it has a single automated system to compile state breakthrough data or how it works, quote, it's not like there's even going to be one person who can tell you all that within a public health department, said David Dowdy, MD, PhD, an epidemiologist at the Johns Hopkins School of Public Health in Baltimore. Quote, there is no system, is what I'm trying to say. Guidance for public health departments. Following the CDC's online trail provides some insight. Guidance to state health departments and other public health actors asks them to use multiple data collection entities. In a document from April 2021, a more recent version is less detailed, the CDC clarified its May shift to only reporting breakthrough hospitalizations and deaths rather than all breakthrough cases. Complicating matters is an apparent shift in data collection altogether. The CDC explained in its guidance from April that it developed a national vaccine breakthrough database via REDCap, but, quote, ultimately will use the National Notifiable Diseases Surveillance System and NDSS instead. When the switch happens, state health departments would stop reporting cases into REDCap directly, submit to the NNDSS instead, and the CDC will enter the data into REDCap. On the NNDSS website, a number of guidance pages and PowerPoint webinars do describe what seems to be a new way 
to report COVID-19 case data that is meant to, quote, streamline case surveillance. One PowerPoint from November does mention breakthrough cases and red cap. The guide itself contains over 100 data elements that public health departments should include with each reported COVID-19 case on their, quote, onboarding map. Four states are marked as having moved past onboarding and into, quote, production, seemingly for using the new standards. On a page promoting onboarding speeds, the NNDSS office says it cut the onboarding process to 2.5 months. Of the transition to NNDSS from REDCap, Malati Rivera says she has many unanswered questions. Remaining challenges. Standardizing data from 50 different states is no easy feat. Quote, I think that we have a more fragmented public health system than people realize, said Dowdy. Quote, people want to think that there is this nationwide registry that all states kind of buy into, but each state has its own system. The challenges are many. For example, though the CDC has a standard definition of a, quote, breakthrough case, it might not line up with each state's definition, Malati Rivera said. Many states do record breakthrough data, whereas others may just send along immunization data and COVID-19 test data for the CDC to sort through. Kansas, for example, is listed as a participating jurisdiction for the CDC's breakthrough tracker. However, Matthew Lara of the Kansas Department of Health and Environment told MedPage today that they were not reporting breakthrough rates. States that do track breakthroughs may do so at different time intervals. There are multiple components that the CDC needs to have, immunization records, hospitalization records, testing information, and death records to verify the information. And each state has different ways of collecting each of these elements. Comment, I just keep, there is no federal solution. Well, yeah. Quote, you're still dealing with very unstandardized data, and that's what's made this very difficult, said Malati Rivera. Without federal standards, you're basically looking at 50 disparate systems to describe one thing. And public health departments may not all have the resources to maintain good systems, let alone the staff time to devote to standardizing data for the CDC. Some have extensive networks for hospitals to share electronic health records, and others don't. Quote, they don't have the money to update their information systems on a regular basis. They don't have a lot of people, and suddenly they're being asked to do this coordination, said Dowdy. According to the CDC, all states have electronic lab reporting, though not all have automatic sharing of electronic health records with public health agencies, something the data modernization portion of the CARES Act seeks to address. Each state even has a slightly different system for storing immunization records. For now, the U.S. looks to data from countries like the U.K. and Israel for guidance on vaccine effectiveness. These countries have fewer people to monitor, but also more centralized and robust systems for tracking COVID spread. Others, like the Pandemic Tracking Collective Maladi Leads, have undertaken efforts to compile state data themselves. Quote, I don't have a lot of confidence in the CDC's ability to track this, to be completely honest, Maladi said. That's why our team is working really hard to kind of help add some more data transparency to the public. So that's the end of the article. It seems to me like we have a CDC which is kind of not really wanting to look at or acknowledge the full extent of the problem, doesn't want us to either, and then is pitching, quote, solutions, these these policy guidelines that seem destined to fail and that are alarming a lot of people, myself included, and... I don't know what, we're just supposed to coast on this. Well, it's not going to work. This is wishful thinking at best. And the real life systems that we all use, transportation, grocery, schools, emergency services, you name it, these are all going to be impacted and they're already being impacted. We have a couple articles on that. Here are some screenshots from a New York Times article. Headline, beleaguered by Omicron, New York operates at half speed from subway lines to medical clinics to libraries. City businesses and services have been curtailed because of COVID. To fill staffing voids, the fire department called up several ambulance crews of medics who are due to graduate shortly from the department's EMS Academy. It has also mandated overtime shifts and reassigned some administrative workers to frontline emergency crews. The police department, where some commands are operating at half staffing, has canceled days off for any officer healthy enough to work through New Year's weekend, 
said Sergeant Edward Riley, a department spokesman. More than one in six firefighters are out sick, and nearly one in three EMS workers are on medical leave. Signs of a partly shuttered city were everywhere on Wednesday. The W subway line was suspended early Wednesday morning and stayed offline for the day. Clicking the status button for the A, D, E, N, and R trains brought up a message, quote, you may wait longer for a train, it said. Quote, we're running as much service as we can with the train crews we have available. Again, contrast this with Rochelle Walensky's, oh, we got to get people back to work. It's wishful thinking. You're, <laughs> this is a dangerous game they're playing. Also, insightful tweet here from at Prolpo. Friendly reminder that people have been coerced to work while sick with COVID throughout the pandemic. The state is just publicly endorsing this practice now. That is true. On to the story, Union, Testing Inadequate to Reopen New York City Schools, by Lauren Camara. This is out of U.S. News & World Report, December 29. As schools across the country prepare to resume in-person learning, after the, I can't believe this is happening, in-person learning after the holidays, the union that represents educators in New York City, the largest school district in the country, is warning city officials that schools do not have adequate testing available to reopen safely. Quote, Teachers are prepared to do their jobs starting January 3rd, United Federation of Teachers President Michael Mulgrew said in a statement. Quote, The real issue is whether the city can do its job, ensuring that new testing initiatives are available in every school and an improved situation room is actually in place by next week. As of last week, Union officials said that 177 schools in the city hadn't had access to testing for two weeks. Since then, New York Governor Kathy Hochul directed 2 million rapid tests to city schools and Mayor Bill de Blasio's and Mayor-elect Eric Adams' teams have worked to reestablish the office created to track school infections in real time and provide guidance on quarantines and closures, the so-called Situation Room. Quote, we are moving closer to a safe reopening of school next week, Mulgrew said, quote, but we are not there yet. The shot across the bow from the 200,000-member union comes as coronavirus cases among children, quote, are extremely high and increasing, according to a report from the American Academy of Pediatrics and the Children's Hospital Association. The weekly number of coronavirus cases among children has increased 50% since the start of December, reaching nearly 200,000 pediatric cases reported last week, according to the report. The spike is especially evident in New York, where state health officials said earlier this week that the number of hospitalized children with COVID-19 in New York City has nearly quadrupled this month. In the week starting December 5, New York City hospitals admitted 22 children, but by the five-day period beginning December 19, that figure rose to 109, according to New York State Health Commissioner Mary Bassett. Public health officials say that they expect coronavirus cases among children to increase after the holidays and into the winter months. And with pediatric vaccination rates dramatically slowing as Omicron surges, many are concerned about what the near future will look like, especially for schools. Complicating matters further, FDA officials now say that the Omicron variant, which is highly transmissible but so far is not causing severe infections in children, uh, we'll look at that in a minute, is more difficult to detect with rapid antigen tests, which is what the lion's share of schools are using to track infections and outbreaks. The Biden administration is continuing to pressure schools to remain open despite the swell of new infections. Earlier this month, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention Director Rochelle Walensky endorsed test-to-stay policies, and Education Secretary Miguel Cardona urged school districts to use federal coronavirus aid to fend off teacher and staff shortages. Quote, schools should be approaching Omicron with caution, but not fear. Oh, boy. Cardona tweeted Tuesday, quote, just like we teach in the classroom, we can learn from past experiences, trust the science, and use tools like test to stay and vaccination to keep schools safe and open, unquote, end of article. Yeah, except it's questionable whether you're actually following the science, and anyone uh, not 
somewhat alarmed, if not panicking, about Omicron really isn't looking at what's going on. Ask a healthcare worker. I mean, think back to what, you know, the Biden administration has been tweeting. Unemployment's down. The economy's back. We're doing it, folks. They just want to, like, get numbers up, try to shoehorn this whole back to normal thing and just slap a mission accomplished sticker on it. It's not going to work. This is, at best, supreme vanity. Now, what will that vanity cost us? I said before, they're playing a dangerous game. They're playing it with their economy, but our lives. Well, here's one thing. Here's a story from The Independent UK by Jade Brenner, dated 2 December 2021. Headline, Your baby won't be affected by COVID, couple told, before three-month-old son dies from virus. Be careful who touches your baby, warns mother who lost her newborn to coronavirus. A couple has shared the cautionary tale of losing their three-month-old baby in February to COVID. Children under the age of five are not yet able to have the coronavirus vaccine, but mother Angelina Rendon was repeatedly told not to worry about her infant's safety. Quote, I don't know how many times a doctor has told me, don't worry, your baby won't be affected by COVID. But he was, unfortunately, said Ms. Rendon to Sacramento Network, KCRA3. Quote, be careful who touches your baby, said Ms. Rendon, warning other parents with infants of the very real risk of coronavirus. Quote, it can just start with a little kiss from somebody you know who was exposed and not shown symptoms. We took heartbreak in our family because of COVID, said Mr. Rendon. We lost an infant to something we had no control over. The couple now has the ashes of their son in a cabinet and hopes people will heed their advice and protect their loved ones against the virus. According to the American Academy of Pediatrics, AAP, and the Children's Hospital Association, as of 25 November, some 6.9 million children have tested positive for COVID since the start of the pandemic. Child cases of the disease have been above 100,000 for the 16th week in a row in the U.S. Children have made up 17% of total coronavirus cases in the U.S. The advice has always been that children are not as susceptible to the severe effects of the disease. But as the Rendons can testify, this doesn't mean it doesn't happen. Quote, our doctor said our son was healthy, said Mr. Rendon. Coronavirus didn't build his system, it destroyed his system, he explained. AAP maintains that more research is needed on the effects of COVID on minors. Quote, it appears that severe illness due to COVID-19 is uncommon among children. However, there is an urgent need to collect more data on longer-term impacts of the pandemic on children, including ways the virus may harm the long-term physical health of infected children, as well as its emotional and mental health effects, stated the Academy. With the emergence of the Omicron variant, which has fueled a worrying surge of cases in South Africa, remember this is from earlier this month, now it's here, many experts are advising extra vigilance when it comes to social distancing. Next article concerning children's health. This one's from Ars Technica by Beth Moll, dated December 30, 2021. Headline, Children's Hospitals Are Filling Nationwide Amid Tidal Wave of Omicron. Omicron's severity in kids is still unknown, but more cases mean more hospitalizations. And the picture there is of a Boston Medical Center pediatrician performing a checkup on an eight-month-old while her father provides her comfort in a pediatrics tent set up outside a Boston Medical Center back in April. The article starts, the number of children hospitalized with COVID-19 in the U.S. is skyrocketing amid the Omicron wave, with new admissions up 66% in the last week and now past the all-time record high for the pandemic. The surge in pediatric hospitalizations comes amid a record-smashing vertical rise in overall cases, which is being driven by the ultra-transmissible Omicron coronavirus variant. Though preliminary data continues to link Omicron waves to milder disease and fewer hospitalizations compared with previous variants, comment there. Eric Feigelding has done a lot on this, and there's something called Simpson's Paradox. This is a statistical phenomenon which is somewhat counterintuitive. Basically, you take two groups which both show a statistical trend, but then when you combine them, it appears to reverse the trend. This may be driving some of the appearance 
of Omicron having a lesser severity than Delta or other strains. But it may not actually be the case. Basically, the problem is that Omicron may be infecting people who wouldn't necessarily have gotten Delta, but because Omicron is so good at evading immunity, it gives them a mild infection. When you then add these people to the overall group, it looks like the overall severity went down. However, those are people who wouldn't necessarily have been infected with Delta because their immunity is better. And the people who weren't in that position, Omicron may not affect them more mildly at all. So it's a little confusing, but basically I would suggest using extreme caution with embracing these reports of, you know, that it's milder or something like that. I think that there's good data to suggest that that may not be the case. Again, check out Feigl Ding for more on that. I think that he had estimated specifically that Omicron might be inherently 2, maybe 12% milder. That's not really significant to change anything fundamental. Again, nobody's quite sure yet because there's just like this tidal wave of information coming in and statisticians are still sorting through it. Okay, back to the article and taking that sentence again. Though preliminary data continue to link Omicron waves to milder disease and fewer hospitalizations compared with previous variants, it's still unclear if the variant is intrinsically less virulent in people generally, and specifically children. Laboratory studies continue to indicate that Omicron causes milder lung disease in rodents than previous variants, but mild Omicron waves in humans have been largely seen in populations with high levels of pre-existing protection from prior COVID-19 infection and or vaccination. Such populations are expected to have less severe disease overall. Still, even if Omicron does cause milder disease, it can still easily trounce healthcare systems, as we are already seeing. The colossal number of Omicron infections means that even a relatively small proportion of severe cases will still result in a large number of people in the hospital. On Wednesday, the U.S. logged its highest single-day tally of new COVID-19 cases yet in the pandemic, 488,988 cases, according to data tracking by the New York Times. The seven-day average is also at an all-time high of 301,472, up 153% over the past two weeks. This average breaks the previous record, set in early January of last year, at around 250,000 cases. So far, daily hospitalizations are up 14% overall in the last two weeks, and the current seven-day average is up to 77,851. Though hospitalizations typically lag case rises by a week or more, the rise in hospitalizations to date appears to be smaller than would be expected based on previous variants. But hospitalizations in children have seen a steeper incline. According to the latest data from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the current seven-day average for new daily hospital admissions in children under 17 is 378. The current rate of child hospital admissions with COVID-19 is now higher than ever before in the pandemic, with a rate of 0.52 admissions per 100,000. The previous record, set in early September, was 0.47. In a White House press briefing Wednesday, top infectious disease expert Anthony Fauci noted that it's still unclear how severe Omicron will be in children. Quote, Certainly, more children are being infected with the highly transmissible virus, and with that, there naturally will be more hospitalizations in children, Fauci said. Quote, It is noteworthy, however, that many children are hospitalized with covid as opposed to because of COVID, reflecting the high degree of penetrance of infection among the pediatric population, unquote. While COVID-19 has tended to be milder in children than in adults with previous variants, it still can be severe and even deadly. So far in the pandemic, 1,040 children aged 17 and younger have died from COVID-19, including 332 children under the age of five. The CDC has also recorded 5,973 cases of MISC, multisystem inflammatory syndrome, in children, a rare complication of COVID-19 in children. Comment, it may be rare, although it is also about six times more common than death. Continuing, of those MISC cases, 52 were fatal. That's the end of the article. 
unfortunately here we are in more of a wait and see situation and unfortunately in my opinion the cdc is really heightening everyone's risk i mean the government as a whole and the state governments could be doing a lot more to lower people's risk via systemic protection structural changes that could protect people in general and children in particular from this virus we have no idea what's going to be happening with Omicron, but it looks bad and it's spreading fast. So anything that we get in terms of protections, whatever, uh, we're going to have to fight for them. That is clear. Here's a tweet that has a few examples of what we can be demanding. This is courtesy of at Oman Reagan. Just a tweet I liked. Right now we need emergency action. Send masks and tests. Close non-essential business. Share vaccine and treatment technology, send monthly checks, ban evictions and utility shutoffs, expand emergency health care, abolish student and medical debt, hazard pay plus for essential workers, etc. I would certainly add Medicare for all. These are the kinds of things that we need to start demanding and we need to form coalitions to demand them. Not only is this going to put our politics more in the right direction, it's also going to undercut support for reactionary, quote, mistakes or, quote, misguided individuals who, for example, storm a Burger King trying to stage a protest against vaccine mandates or whatever. You know, when people were trying to run cover for the one six fascist coup attempt, I mean, not to defend the bourgeois government, but having a fascist coup would be even worse at this point. Definitely not in our interests, either short term or long term. But you had people, for example, Jimmy Dore, we've covered before, was trying to give cover for these people. Like, see, look at this woman. She's just a average working person who, you know, if the government had paid her to stay home and shut her business down, then, you know, this wouldn't have happened. No, these are people who could afford a private jet to get down to the protest in a particular case that we were highlighting in a Jimmy Dore criticism video. But you go back to the shutdown. I mean, whether it's one six or not, Go back to the shutdown in like April and May when the right wing was staging armed reopen protests, anti-shutdown protests, where you had Boogaloo boys out there with serious weaponry staging protests, get everybody back to work. This was like a couple of months into the pandemic. Well, if we get the right kind of demands going and then those people aren't interested as they're not in joining them, then it makes it that much clearer and that much harder for people to try to confuse the issue by saying, oh, they're just honest working people who, you know, oppose the government trying to shut them down. No, no, no. They're making the wrong demands. Their solution, quote unquote, is worse than the current problem. As socialists, we don't want to support that. We don't want to support fascist coups. So we get the right kind of demands going, and then it's super clear who's on what side. Now, for an example of doing the right things in practice, Here's an article from Danny Haifong. This is shared at Friends of Socialist China. The article is China's dynamic zero COVID policy remains a model for the world. And it is. So the article says this article from Danny Haifong, first published in CGTN, a Chinese news source I recommend following. You can get a lot of perspectives there. You're not going to get anywhere else. Discusses key recent developments in the COVID pandemic, including the emergence of the Omicron variant, and the announcement of a lockdown in the Chinese city of Xi'an. Danny notes that China's strategy of early detection, mass testing, quarantine, and properly supported lockdowns continues to represent a model of a people-first approach to managing the pandemic. The Omicron variant represents another troubling chapter in the COVID-19 pandemic. Countless travel plans have been canceled as scientists and infectious disease experts attempt to gain a greater understanding of the latest variant. In the United States, shortages in tests and healthcare workers have placed immediate strains on society. Forecasts for global economic growth have become less optimistic. Bloomberg Magazine, a U.S. media outlet known for its anti-China bias, recently admitted that China's dynamic zero COVID policy has been an effective measure against the pandemic. The report stated that China's average daily COVID-19 cases would rise to 637,155 if the country adopted a U.S.-style approach to the pandemic. 
Bloomberg quickly changed the subject to more anti-China talking points and avoided any elaboration on the factors for China's success against COVID-19. Bloomberg repeated a trend in U.S. media which either ignores the success of the dynamic zero-COVID policy or calls it authoritarian. This has come at a great cost to the people of the United States and Western countries who have suffered the worst consequences of the pandemic. Yet the U.S. and Western media have taken part in endless speculation about China's policy to deflect from the failed COVID-19 responses of their own nations. The truth is that China has by far been the most successful in protecting human life over the course of the pandemic. China has experienced three deaths per million in the population from COVID-19. The United States, which leads the world in the total number of COVID-19 cases and deaths in the pandemic, averages more than 2,400 deaths per million in the population. U.S. and Western media have claimed China's policy cannot be emulated in so-called free and democratic societies, i.e. capitalist. China is accused of irrationally attempting to prevent transmission entirely, the costs of which are too high for Western societies that prioritize the economy over the health of the public. This is problematic for several reasons. First, China's strategy does not seek to eliminate transmission entirely, but rather to reduce the human and economic costs of the pandemic as quickly and effectively as possible. Second, the depiction of China's dynamic zero-COVID policy as, quote, irrational and detrimental to the economy ignores the fact that Western economies have experienced the harshest economic fallout from the pandemic. U.S. economic growth had only begun to catch up to a 2% GDP year-on-year -year average growth in recent months before Omicron reignited economic uncertainty. Comment. Of course, it's exactly that uncertainty, economic and otherwise, that really I am so freaked out about living in this collapsing country. I mean, seriously, is anyone else as tired of this as I am? We just spent two years fucking like trying to deal with this thing. And like now the virus is worse than ever. And the government is just throwing up their hands. All right. Anyway, I'm, I'm just, you know, I'm trying to live my life here. It's crazy. Anyway, everything's on hold because of this. It's nuts. Going on, China was the fastest major economy to achieve growth amid the pandemic and, according to World Bank estimates, is set to grow at two to three times the rate of the United States in 2022. Clearly, China's dynamic zero-COVID policy has taken economic development into account from the very beginning. Perhaps the most troubling aspect of the U.S. and Western rejection of China's dynamic zero-COVID policy is that it reflects how effectively misinformation has spread within societies that have adopted a wrong-headed anti-China political agenda. The United States, for example, was racked with such high levels of distrust in both the government and healthcare system that an infodemic took hold very early on in the pandemic. Former President Donald Trump only aided in spreading misinformation about the pandemic by blaming China for the U.S.'s woes and frequently employing the term China virus during his briefs to the country. Current President Joe Biden has done little to increase confidence in the U.S.'s capacity to protect human life beyond a change in rhetoric. So good points there. I have to say also, I have friends in China, and I remember last year when uh, somebody who was in the U.S. went to China, had to do the whole quarantine for several weeks thing, and they were in a hotel and the government was just bringing them like large boxes of amazing looking food. And it was wonderful. And they've been super happy over in China. So, yeah. Anyway, contrasting that good piece of journalism with, you know, in the world of the quote alternative media, just because somebody has learned to use the term anti-imperialist or whatever does not mean you can trust them. There's a ton of libertarian contrarians who are just going to turn on you. I mentioned Jimmy Dore before. Here's one uh, just contrasting quickly. Max Blumenthal, who I tweeted on December 25th, is moving into the COVID denial grift now. Uh, retweeted a tweet from Max that says, Julian Assange is responsible for as many American deaths as Omicron. Zero. And it's like, hmm, what's this all about? Well, if we go to the Gray Zones website, we find an article co-written by Max Blumenthal, which is all about how the lockdowns are you know, worse than the virus and, you know, oh, loneliness and blah, blah, blah. If we zoom down to the end of the article, we have a passage here. 
even before the threat from, and this is from December, early December, even before the threat from the so-called Omicron variant is known, the U.S. and EU have enacted new restrictions which are certain to ravage the already weathered economies of Southern Africa, etc., etc. Basically, beware of these contrarian outlets that, when you're not looking, are going to start slipping in COVID denial and, oh yeah, we're not anti-vaccine, we're anti-mandate. Sure, sure, yeah. You're also not contributing anything constructive. Actually, there's a nice meme here somebody made. Introducing a new era in bipartisan cooperation in America. Quote from Donald Trump, We cannot let the cure be worse than the problem itself. Also, Joe Biden, There is no federal solution for the coronavirus. The solution will have to come from the states. Introducing a new era in bipartisan cooperation where what's good for business is good for America. Aren't you tired of all the screaming, fighting, property damage, and friends and neighbors at each other's throats? We have the answer. It's called herd immunity. No vaccines, no masks, no lockdowns, no social engineering problems. Just people living by their own set of rules, making their own decisions. We, the undersigned on the right, definitely, and the left, support the Great Barrington Declaration, which seeks to return America and the world back to where things used to be, before all the fear-mongering and hysteria took hold in February 2020. Joe Biden, Donald Trump, Jimmy Dore, Madison Cawthorn, Fiorella Isabel, Convo Couch, Rand Paul, Nico House, of course affiliated with Tulsi, Jim Jordan, Mike Parson, Slow News Day, Tucker Carlson, Glenn Greenwald, who, by the way, has gone off the rails if you follow that guy on Twitter, Max Blumenthal, Marjorie Taylor Greene, Thomas Massey, Ted Cruz, Josh Hawley, Dr. Robert Malone, RFK Jr., Simone Gold, The One America News Network, The Great Barrington Declaration, proudly making America sick again since 2020. So this Great Barrington Declaration is based, Great Barrington is a town in western Massachusetts near the New York border where there is a libertarian think tank and earlier they published this declaration. You know, basically the most insidious thing about libertarianism is it's hyper-capitalism, it's basically crypto-fascism, and it will sometimes pretend to make left-like arguments exactly like Max Blumenthal was doing in that article. Like, is it about crushing the curve or crushing the global poor? Who do the lockdowns really serve, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, watch out for people pushing this kind of stuff. And uh, that's all I'm going to say about that. All right. But speaking of making people sick, in this last segment, I would like to talk about some of the non-death related negative health outcomes from COVID-19, specifically IQ dropping and then also the effects of long COVID. So here we have a tweet from Denise DeWald, MD. There is a measurable decline in cognitive function in people who had just one episode of COVID. What happens after multiple bouts with the virus? So let's take a look at this article. It's from The Lancet. The title is Cognitive Deficits in People Who Have Recovered from COVID-19. The article is dated 30 May, 2021, and it was made available online 23 July 2021. It was authored by a number of researchers working out of the United States and the United Kingdom. So the abstract, background, there is growing concern about possible cognitive consequences of COVID-19, with reports of long COVID symptoms persisting into the chronic phase and case studies revealing neurological problems in severely affected patients. However, there is little information regarding the nature and broader prevalence of cognitive problems post-infection, or across the full spread of disease severity. Methods. We sought to confirm whether there was an association between cross-sectional cognitive performance data from over 80,000 participants who, between January and December 2020, undertook a clinically validated web-optimized assessment as part of the Great British Intelligence Test and questionnaire items capturing self-report of suspected and confirmed COVID-19 infection and respiratory symptoms. Findings. People who had recovered from COVID-19, including those no longer reporting symptoms, exhibited significant cognitive deficits versus controls when controlling for age, gender, education level, income, racial ethnic group, pre-existing medical disorders, tiredness, depression, and anxiety. The deficits were of substantial effect size for people who had been hospitalized, sample size 192, but also for non-hospitalized cases, 
who had biological confirmation of COVID-19 infection. The group had 326 people in it. Analyzing markers of premorbid intelligence did not support these differences being present prior to infection. Finer-grained analysis of performance across subtests supported the hypothesis that COVID-19 has a multi-domain impact on human cognition. Interpretation. These results accord with reports of long COVID cognitive symptoms that persist into the early chronic phase. They should act as a clarion call for further research with longitudinal and neuroimaging cohorts to plot recovery trajectories and identify the biological basis of cognitive deficits in SARS coronavirus 2 survivors. So I want to jump down to a graphic here. Here there are five categories, people who had symptoms but not respiratory symptoms. Then people who had respiratory symptoms with no assistance at home versus people who had, in the third column, respiratory symptoms and medical assistance at home in the fourth column, people who were hospitalized but not put on a ventilator, and then in the fifth column, people who were hospitalized and were put on a ventilator. You can see that the range of some of the groups do overlap with the surrounding groups. However, there is a clear trend. People who had more severe symptoms, especially requiring hospitalization, uh, either with or without a ventilator, very significant reductions in cognitive function. Let's switch over to another article titled Long COVID, an overview. This was from researchers working in India and Oman, published in a journal called Diabetes and Metabolic Syndrome, Clinical Research and Reviews, accepted 6 April 2021, reading from the abstract, background and aims. Long COVID is the collective term to denote persistence of symptoms in those who have recovered from SARS coronavirus 2 infection. Methods. We searched the PubMed and Scopus databases for original articles and reviews. Based on the search result, in this review article, we are analyzing various aspects of long COVID. Results. Fatigue, cough, chest tightness, breathlessness, palpitations, myalgia, and difficulty in focusing are symptoms reported in long COVID. It could be related to organ damage, post-viral syndrome, post-critical care syndrome, and others. Clinical evaluation should focus on identifying the pathophysiology, followed by appropriate remedial measures. In people with symptoms suggestive of long COVID, but without known history of previous SARS-2 infection, serology, that's blood analysis basically, may help to confirm the diagnosis. So I want to read more from this article in terms of details because I think that that's important. So we're going to read that. This is going to be the last section, and then I have one more section to close up this video. So starting the article, one, introduction. SARS coronavirus 2 infection, COVID-19, is a major pandemic resulting in substantial mortality and morbidity, that means disease, worldwide. Of the individuals affected, about 80% had mild to moderate disease, and among those with severe disease, 5% developed critical illness. A few of those who recovered from COVID-19 developed persistent or new symptoms lasting weeks or months. This is called long COVID, long haulers, or post-COVID syndrome. Section 1-1, acute COVID. Those infected with SARS coronavirus 2 virus commonly develop symptoms four to five days after exposure. Acute COVID symptoms include fever, throat pain, cough, muscle or body aches, loss of taste or smell, and diarrhea. A study from England, Wales, and Scotland identified three clusters of symptoms during acute illness. They are 1. Respiratory symptom cluster with cough, sputum or mucus, shortness of breath, and fever. 2. Musculoskeletal symptom cluster with myalgia, joint pain, headache, and fatigue. Myalgia is basically muscle pain, achiness if you like. 3. Enteric symptom cluster with abdominal pain, vomiting, and diarrhea. COVID symptom study group identified six clusters of symptoms. They are 1. Flu-like with no fever, headache, loss of smell, muscle pains, cough, sore throat, chest pain, no fever. 2. Flu-like with fever, headache, loss of smell, cough, sore throat, hoarseness, fever, loss of appetite. 3. Gastrointestinal, headache, loss of smell, loss of appetite, diarrhea, sore throat, chest pain, no cough. 4. 
severe level one, fatigue, headache, loss of smell, cough, fever, hoarseness, chest pain, fatigue. Five, severe level two, confusion, headache, loss of smell, loss of appetite, cough, fever, hoarseness, sore throat, chest pain, fatigue, confusion, muscle pain. Six, severe level three, abdominal and respiratory, headache, loss of smell, loss of appetite, cough, fever, hoarseness, sore throat, chest pain, fatigue, confusion, muscle pain, shortness of breath, diarrhea, abdominal pain. Recovery from mild SARS coronavirus 2 infection commonly occurs within 7 to 10 days after the onset of symptoms in mild disease. It could take 3 to 6 weeks in severe or critical illness. However, continued follow-up of patients who recovered from COVID-19 showed that one or more symptoms persist in a substantial percentage of people, even weeks or months after COVID-19. 1.2. Long COVID. The term long COVID was first used by Perego in social media to denote persistence of symptoms weeks or months after initial SARS coronavirus 2 infection, and the term long haulers was used by Watson and by Young. Long COVID is a term used to describe the presence of various symptoms, even weeks or months after acquiring SARS coronavirus 2 infection, irrespective of the viral status. It is also called post COVID syndrome. It can be continuous or relapsing and remitting in nature. There can be the persistence of one or more symptoms of acute COVID or the appearance of new symptoms. The majority of people with post COVID syndrome are PCR negative, indicating microbiological recovery. In other words, post COVID syndrome is the time lag between the microbiological recovery and clinical recovery. In other words, your body, and I'm commenting now, your body has fought off the virus but has not clinically recovered. You still have symptoms and things going on. You have, in other words, killed the infection, but you're not completely well again. Continuing, the majority of those with long COVID show biochemical and radiological recovery. Depending upon the duration of symptoms, post-COVID or long COVID can be divided into two stages. Post-acute COVID, where symptoms extend beyond three weeks, but less than 12 weeks, and chronic COVID, where symptoms extend beyond 12 weeks. And there's a graphic there to show that. Thus, among people infected with SARS coronavirus 2, the presence of one or more symptoms, continuous or relapsing and remitting, meaning on and off, new or same symptoms of acute COVID, even after the expected period of clinical recovery, irrespective of the underlying mechanism, is defined as post-COVID syndrome or long COVID. There are several challenges in the diagnosis of long COVID. The time taken for the clinical recovery varies depending upon the severity of illness, while associated complications make it difficult to define the cutoff time for the diagnosis. A significant proportion of SARS coronavirus 2 infected individuals are asymptomatic, and many individuals would not have undergone any test to confirm SARS coronavirus 2 infection. If these individuals develop multiple symptoms subsequently, making a diagnosis of long COVID without preceding evidence of SARS coronavirus 2 infection is challenging. Comment, in other words, they're saying that you could have long COVID even if you had an asymptomatic acute COVID period. So you may not have had really symptoms at first, but then you develop this long COVID afterward. So making a diagnosis of long COVID without preceding evidence that you were infected. In other words, if you were asymptomatic, you may not have been tested unless you, for one reason or another, were just getting tested at a weekly basis. For example, if you were a student or if your job required it, etc. Continuing. The testing policy varies in different countries, and it is a common practice during a pandemic to diagnose clinically based on symptoms without any confirmatory tests. Therefore, Persistence of symptoms in those who had never checked for COVID is a challenge. Similarly, residual symptoms in those checked negative for COVID, false negative as testing may be done too early or too late in the disease course, comment, basically, um, you may have given a false negative, like you were actually positive for COVID, but the test came back falsely negative. Either it was done too early before it could be detected, or it was too late 
after your body had already fought it off and couldn't be picked up on the test anymore. Continuing, may add also to the diagnostic dilemma. Antibody response to infection also varies, and about 20% of the time does not seroconvert. Antibody level may decrease over time, challenging the retrospective diagnosis of recent SARS coronavirus 2 infection. What does that mean? Antibody response to infection also varies. So when your body encounters particular kinds of substances that can bind to certain cells in your immune system, these are called antigens, the substances coming in, your body can produce antibodies to deal with them. Seroconversion is that process of developing antibodies in response to an infection or whatever other you know, substance coming in your body. So basically when they're saying antibody response to infection varies and 20% of the time does not seroconvert, so basically they're saying that the antibodies are not detectable in the blood serum because 20% of the time it didn't do seroconversion. Anyway, antibody level may decrease over time, challenging the retrospective diagnosis of recent SARS coronavirus 2 infection. So your antibody levels may decrease over time, so you may not be able to detect the antibodies, and therefore you can't tell that you had coronavirus. All right. Section 1.3, long COVID, real-world scenario. A report from Italy found that 87% of people recovered and discharged from hospitals showed persistence of at least one symptom, even at 60 days afterward. Of these, 32% had one or two symptoms, whereas 55% had three or more. Fever or features of acute illness was not seen in these patients. Comment, so basically fever is more of a response that your body would have while trying to actively fight off the infection. Once the infection is gone, your body may be going through other processes, but not probably fever or you know other things that commonly happen during the early active infection. That said, you can have other symptoms. Continuing, the commonly reported problems were fatigue, in 53.1%, worsened quality of life, 44.1%, dyspnea, difficulty breathing, 43.4%, joint pain, 27.3%, and chest pain, 21.7%. Cough, skin rashes, palpitations, that's your heart fluttering, headache, diarrhea, and pins and needles sensation were the other symptoms reported. So pausing right there, we got cough, that's the respiratory system. Skin rashes, that's obviously your skin. Palpitations, that's your cardiovascular system and heart. Headache, that's probably your neurological system, could also be cardiovascular if there's some kind of like a blood flow issue causing the headache. Diarrhea, so you got your digestive system. And pins and needles sensation, that's neurological, that's your nerves. So we're talking about symptoms across major multiple systems of the body here. Continuing. Patients also reported inability to do routine daily activities, in addition to mental health issues such as anxiety, depression, and post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD. Another study found that COVID-19 patients discharged from hospital experienced breathlessness and excessive fatigue even at three months. The prevalence of residual symptoms is about 35%, one in three, in patients treated for COVID-19 on an outpatient basis, but around 87% among cohorts of hospitalized patients. Comment, what does this mean? People who have a milder case of COVID where they're be able to be treated on an outpatient basis, they're not hospitalized, they have residual symptoms about one in three people, whereas two out of three, they recover and they don't have the residual symptoms. However, Almost all of the hospitalized patients, basically 9 out of 10, 87 out of 100 of them, have residual symptoms. So if your COVID is bad enough that you got hospitalized, odds are almost 9 out of 10 that you're going to have some kind of long COVID. But let's not let that overshadow the fact that patients not treated in the hospital, one in three get residual symptoms. So one in three get long COVID, actually slightly more than one in three. Continuing, the percentage of people who failed to return to their job at 14 to 21 days after becoming COVID positive was 35%, according to one survey. It's more common in older age groups, 26% in 18 to 34 years, so that's still one in four 
in younger adults, 32% in 35 to 49 years, so one in three among people who aren't yet middle-aged, and 47%, about half, in people 50 years and above, and among those with comorbidities. Comorbidities are other diseases, basically. 28% with nil or one comorbidity, 46% with two, and 57% with three or more comorbidities. So commenting, basically, the more other problems that you have, your odds of failing to return to your job two to three weeks after becoming COVID positive significantly increase, like to really substantial levels, like 46%, 57%. So this is what I was talking about before. You can't just be like, oh, everybody go to work, you know, and oh, if you get COVID, then whatever. Well, no, not whatever, because if you're not in perfect health, your odds are pretty substantial. And even if you are in perfect health, your odds are fairly substantial of not being able to go back to work three weeks later because you have all these other problems, fatigue, whatever else. Continuing, obesity defined as having a body mass index greater than 30 and the presence of psychiatric conditions such as anxiety disorder, depression, PTSD, paranoia, OCD, schizophrenia, and commenting, of course, anxiety and depression are incredibly common. A lot of those other ones less so, but anxiety and depression are very prevalent. Anxiety disorders are like almost 20% prevalence, I think. And then depressive disorders, it varies, but it's somewhere around like 10%. Anyway, but that's a lot of people. That's like one in five, one in 10. And a lot of times they occur together, but basically you know, having obesity or the presence of one of these conditions, which are incredibly common, continuing, are associated with greater than twofold odds of not returning to the job by 14 to 21 days after a positive result. So commenting, again, if you're in perfect health, your odds are still, you know, decent of having significant problems. But if you're not in perfect health and you get COVID and most people aren't in perfect health, you know, your odds go up with everything else going on with you. It's that much harder for your body to deal with the COVID and you're that much more vulnerable to these lasting effects. Continuing, fever and chills present in the acute stage of infection resolved in 97% and 96% of individuals respectively, but cough, fatigue, and shortness of breath did not resolve in 43%, 35%, and 29% of patients during interview. So commenting, that's a tremendous amount of people whose cough, fatigue, and shortness of breath did not resolve, did not go away. Continuing, loss of taste and loss of smell took longer duration for resolution, eight days. As per a recent meta-analysis, the five most common manifestations of long COVID were fatigue, 58%, headache, 44%, attention disorder, 27%, hair loss, 25%, and difficulty breathing, 24%. Among patients admitted to critical care units who were on a ventilator for a prolonged time, residual symptoms are common. However, COVID patients who had mild disease also report not regaining their full pre-COVID health status, effectively questioning the terminology of, quote, mild disease. Comment, of course, the CDC wants us all to think that hey, if you don't wind up in the hospital, you had a mild case. Well, is it really mild when you're having symptoms months afterward? Section 1.4, risk factors for long COVID. Follow-up of patients recovered from COVID identified a few factors which are commonly associated with development of long COVID. The risk of long COVID is twice as common in women compared to men. Increasing age is also a risk factor, and it is found that patients with long COVID are around four years older than those without. The presence of more than five symptoms in the acute stage of illness is associated with the increased risk of developing long COVID. Symptoms most commonly associated with long COVID include fatigue, headache, dyspnea, difficulty breathing, hoarse voice, and myalgia, achiness. Presence of comorbidities, or other simultaneous diseases, also increases the risk of developing post-COVID syndrome, even those with mild symptoms at the initial presentation, that is, during your basic acute infection, were noted to develop long COVID. 1.5. Pathophysiology of long COVID. How does it happen? The exact mechanism behind the persistence of symptoms has yet to be identified, 
reason for the persistence of symptoms can be the sequelae or consequences of organ damage, varying extent of injury, organ damage, and varying time required for the recovery of each organ system, persistence of chronic inflammation, convalescent phase, or immune response, autoantibody generation, rare persistence of virus in the body, so sometimes but rarely the virus will not be fought off by the body, nonspecific effect of hospitalization, just something happened during hospitalization that caused this, sequelae or consequences of critical illness, post-intensive care syndrome, complications related to corona infection or complications related to comorbidities, or adverse effects of medications used. Comment. Some of the medications can be really harsh on different organs such as the liver or kidneys. The kidneys also can get hit really hard by COVID. It's not talked about a lot, but kidney damage in people who are hospitalized is fairly common. Continuing. Persistence of infection can be due to persistent viremia in people with altered immunity, reinfection, or relapse. So in other words, you can have a persistent infection of the virus due to some abnormality in your immune system, which doesn't fight it off completely, or if you get reinfected, or if you start to fight it off, but then you relapse. Deconditioning, psychological issues like post-traumatic stress also contribute to symptoms. The social and financial impact of COVID-19 also contributes to post-COVID issues, including psychological issues. Differentiating residual symptoms from reinfection is important in the public health perspective. So what that means is you want to differentiate what is consequences of just one infection and the consequences just keep persisting versus did somebody get reinfected and they're having symptoms over a long period of time from multi more than one infection point. Continuing, persistently elevated inflammatory markers point towards chronic persistence of inflammation. It is helpful to remember that in any patient, multiple mechanisms may contribute to long COVID symptoms. So that last sentence is important. Helpful to remember that in any patient, there are probably multiple biological mechanisms which are creating these observed symptoms of long-running, long COVID symptoms. Not just one thing is going on biologically, but multiple things. Section 1.6, common symptoms in long COVID. Common symptoms in people with long COVID are profound fatigue, breathlessness, cough, chest pain, palpitations, headache, joint pain, myalgia, and weakness. Comment, muscle weakness, that is something that a lot of people have to go through. You have to go through some kind of physical therapy to regain your muscle strength after a significant COVID infection because COVID is affecting your nervous system and muscles. This is like really serious stuff. Again, it's not in everybody, but a lot of people do get those kinds of effects. Continuing, insomnia, pins and needles, diarrhea, rash or hair loss, impaired balance and gait, neurocognitive issues including memory and concentration problems, and worsened quality of life. In other words, you just feel bad, you're not enjoying yourself. In people with long COVID, one or more symptoms may be present. So, in other words, to qualify as long COVID, you only have to have one, although some people have more than one. Researchers identified two main patterns of symptoms in people with long COVID. They are one, fatigue, headache, and upper respiratory complaints, including shortness of breath, sore throat, persistent cough, and loss of smell, and two, multi-system complaints, including ongoing fever and gastroenterological symptoms. So gastroenterological, more your digestive system. Survivor Corps report shows that 26.5% of people with long COVID experienced painful symptoms. In patients with long COVID, some of the symptoms are first reported three or four weeks after the onset of acute symptoms. So you have acute symptoms, and then like a month later, you get your first bout of long COVID symptoms. That's significant. Profound fatigue is a common problem. And one study showed that at 10 weeks of follow-up after SARS coronavirus 2 infection, more than 50% of people were suffering from fatigue. There was no association between development of fatigue, COVID-19 severity, and level of inflammatory markers. Let's just digest that for a second. So 10 weeks after the follow-up, after the infection, so you get COVID, 
10 weeks later, one in two people were suffering from fatigue. Also, there was not an association between whether you developed the fatigue and how severe your COVID-19 was or the level of inflammatory markers in your body, which are basically signs of stress that your body is dealing with something. Continuing, female sex and diagnosis of depression and anxiety is more common in those with fatigue. Post-viral fatigues are commonly reported in people with viral infections like Epstein-Barr virus, Ebola, influenza, SARS, and MERS. In the absence of any other reason, if fatigue persists for six months or longer, it is called chronic fatigue syndrome. Up to 40% of patients who recovered from SARS of 2003, so commenting, remember, SARS coronavirus 2 is called 2 for a reason. There was an earlier SARS virus, SARS 1, back in the early to mid 2000s. And again, 40% of the people who recovered from that have chronic fatigue. Continuing, the presence of chronic oxidative and nitrosative stress, low-grade inflammation, and impaired heat shock protein production were among the proposed mechanisms for muscle fatigue. So commenting all those things, oxidation, inflammation, heat shock proteins, these are not things you want in your body. These promote aging, and they're basically signs of stress in the body. They are, I mean, part of your immune system. You need these things to live, but having chronic heightened levels of these mean that your body is enduring significant wear and tear. And in this case, they are the among the proposed mechanisms for the muscle fatigue that so many people get after recovering from the acute infection. Continuing, profound fatigue is a challenge not only to the patient, but also to the healthcare provider, as there are no objective methods to diagnose it with certainty. Disruption of trust in the doctor-patient relationship can occur in such settings. So what does this mean? So he, there's a doctor or other healthcare provider, nurse practitioner, whatever, uh, that has a patient with profound fatigue. It's a challenge to the patient because it sucks to live with, but also the healthcare provider, there, as it says, are no objective methods to diagnose it with certainty. And so you basically you have the patient who's suffering and you have the provider who can't really diagnose this clearly. Our just medicine isn't at that level yet. We don't exactly know how to handle this and then what to do with it uh, successfully. I mean, there are things that are done, but it's complicated. And so they're saying that disruption of trust in the doctor-patient relationship can occur because patient has a problem, provider can barely diagnose it or assess what's actually going on, and the patient's like, why am I here? All right. Continuing, infection with SARS coronavirus 2 can lead to various pulmonary complications like chronic cough, fibrotic lung disease, or post-COVID fibrosis, or post-ARDS fibrosis. I'm unfamiliar with that one bronchiectasis, and pulmonary vascular disease. Chronic shortness of breath could be the result of residual pulmonary involvement, meaning lung involvement, which is known to clear slowly with time. Unfortunately, many asymptomatic patients with COVID-19 have significant lung involvement as shown on CT scans. COVID-19 may lead to pulmonary fibrosis, which can result in persistence of dyspnea, difficulty breathing, and need for supplementary oxygen. What does this mean? So the chronic shortness of breath, fibrotic lung disease, bronchiectasis, which is a condition where basically your bronchi or your air passages into your lungs get inflamed and the inflammation causes scarring and they widen and this causes a bunch of problems. And then also pulmonary vascular disease, basically involving the blood supply around the lung. So basically, if you get coronavirus, it's very likely to cause damage to your lungs. That's what this is saying. Inflammation and scarring and fibrotic type conditions, you don't want these. So it can cause difficulty breathing and the need for supplementary oxygen because your lungs are so damaged. Now continuing, common cardiac issues in patients, that's the heart, from COVID-19 include labile heart rate and blood pressure responses to activity. So Lability is like instability, basically. Um, a lot of times it's referred to in the emotions. So emotional lability is like you fly off the handle at the drop of a hat. So labile heart rate and blood pressure responses to activity is like overactive responses to changes in activity. 
myocarditis, that's inflammation of the heart muscle, and pericarditis, also inflammation of the pericardium, impaired myocardial flow reserve from microvascular injury, so basically small blood vessels around the heart getting damaged, myocardial infarction, that's a heart attack, cardiac failure, life-threatening arrhythmias, that's irregular heartbeats, and sudden cardiac death, pretty serious. Coronary artery aneurysm, aortic aneurysm, these are bulges basically in like a weak spot of a blood vessel which can burst, accelerated atherosclerosis, hardening of the arteries, venous and arterial thromboembolic disease, an embolism is like a blockage basically, including life-threatening pulmonary embolism can also occur. Several of these may manifest as long COVID after recovery from acute illness. So these are things included under long COVID. Those are extremely severe. Presence of SARS coronavirus 2 in cerebrospinal fluid. That's the stuff that basically covers your brain and spine and things like that. It's a clear fluid. Shows its neuroinvasive features. So COVID gets into your cerebrospinal fluid. And there is possible disruption to microstructural and functional brain integrity in patients recovered from COVID-19. Headache, tremor, that's shaking, problem with attention and concentration, cognitive blunting or brain fog, dysfunction in the peripheral nerves, that's the nerves in like your extremities, hands, fingers, things like that, and mental health problems like anxiety, depression, and PTSD are common in people with long COVID. Neuropsychiatric manifestations of COVID-19 have been documented in a British study. Stroke and altered mental status were the commonest among this group. So in that British study, looking at neuropsychiatric manifestations, the most common things that they found were stroke and altered mental status, not things you really want to seek out. Multiple psychiatric symptoms stemming from encephalopathy or encephalitis, that's brain disease, brain inflammation, and primary psychiatric diagnoses were noted commonly in young patients. Acquired focal or multifocal peripheral nerve injury was noticed in those who received prone ventilation for COVID-related ARDS. So again, I'm going to guess that's acute respiratory distress, something related to that. Anyway, uh, prone ventilation means you're laying down and you're on a ventilator. So acquired, meaning that you got it at that time, Focal or multifocal peripheral nerve injury was noted in those who received prone ventilation. So, yeah, nerve damage. This is really, <laughs> again, people who are just like, it's a cold. Please, if you've said this just once, slap yourself in the face just once. Because, for real, you don't want to be saying this stuff. All right. Critical illness and prolonged mechanical ventilation due to any cause can result in ICU-acquired weakness, deconditioning, myopathies, neuropathies, and delirium. What does this mean? So critical illness and prolonged mechanical ventilation due to any cause. So no matter what the cause, if you are critically ill with COVID and you require prolonged mechanical ventilation assistance with breathing due to any particular cause, can result in newly acquired, like you get it in the intensive care unit, weakness, deconditioning, that's a multi-system process, which basically everything in your body becomes less efficient. Your muscle tone slackens, your heart becomes less efficient. Everything just doesn't work as well as it did when you were up and around and actually using your body. Myopathies are, again, aches and pains. Neuropathies were like weird nerve sensations and syndromes. And delirium. Post-COVID inflammation can result in various symptoms. Inflammatory arthralgia that's joint pain, has to be differentiated from other similar conditions like rheumatoid arthritis and SLE. Severe infection with SARS coronavirus 2 can result in autoreactivity against a variety of self antigens. So you start getting autoimmune responses to yourself. COVID 19 associated coagulopathy, CAC, can result in both arterial and venous thrombosis. That's clotting. And while clotting is a vital function in healing, you know, to prevent blood loss and things like that, uh, if you have coagulopathy, you're getting clotting in places you don't want it, which can create real problems. So that's the end of section 1.6. This does go on for a while. However, 
I just wanted to basically drive home how severe long COVID can be. For everybody, again, saying, oh, it's just the flu, it's just a cold, I just got the sniffles. You know, that's maybe atypical, <laughs> like even. Some of these things are so common, it's almost uncommon not to get some lasting effect. So we have another diagram here. There's acute infection at the top, then followed by the inflammatory phase, then finally recovery. And you have a flowchart of all the things that can contribute to prolonged symptoms, which then become known as long COVID. And this is figure two, various pathophysiological mechanism. Pathophysiology is disease in your bodily functioning, uh, mechanisms underlying what we call long COVID. So you see there, in the acute infection uh, stage, you can have treatments which may result in drug side effects or interactions that can create prolonged symptoms. Also, infection can create complications which can result in organ damage and prolonged symptoms. You can also have comorbidities or side illnesses going on. The drugs you're taking for those may interact in some way with the drugs that you're given for COVID and that can create prolonged symptoms or the comorbidities themselves can in some way interfere with the processes that are initiated by the COVID infection and that can result in prolonged symptoms, long COVID. During the inflammatory phase, you can have a cytokine storm. So this is a little bit more complicated to explain, but basically a cytokine storm, uh, cytokines are part of your immune system. If you get basically a flush of them too much, it kind of overwhelms your body, can cause, as is shown in the flow chart, organ damage, inflammation, and altered immune status, all of which can result in prolonged symptoms. Also, the altered immune status can result in other infections, which then can create prolonged symptoms. Basically, if COVID has thrown off your immune system and your immune system is temporarily out of whack, you can get infected by other things while your guard is down, so to speak. Immunologically speaking, your guard is down. Also, during the inflammatory phase into the recovery, if you're in a prolonged ICU hospitalization situation, you can get some consequences of critical illness or nonspecific effects of hospitalization deconditioning. That's what I was saying before, people who are bedridden, hospitalized for a long time, your body just like atrophies across the board. You can get, like I said, decreased heart function, overall muscle atrophy. You can get loss of appetite. Like you, you just sort of, it's deconditioning. Like everything that is supposed to work in your body just slackens and falls off and doesn't work as efficiently. So pretty much across the board, your body just has to learn how to function again. One of the main principles of the body is dynamic balance. And if you're just bedridden all the time, there's nothing dynamic going on. And so your body just sort of languishes. Anyway, finally, psychological issues can create prolonged symptoms in a variety of ways. So there are various pathophysiological mechanisms behind long COVID. So please take this seriously. I really, at this point, whether it's on Twitter or on YouTube, I just block people who start in on the like, it's just a cold. I do not have patience for this anymore. And I don't have time to like deal with individual trolls who start in with that kind of garbage. So anyway, for the people willing to listen, there you go. Hopefully this was helpful. And I will put a link to this particular study if you'd like to read it or show other people or whatever, read the part that I didn't read. There's a couple more sections at the end. Basically, the deal with treatment. All right. So hopefully this has been a little bit more nurturing. I mean, we did the whole outrageous, angering political stuff and the you know, social collapse and all that other stuff. Now focusing on something that is a little bit more controllable or at least understandable in terms of what are we talking about when we talk about getting COVID? What does it mean? What is the disease? Um, I don't know. At least I know my mood is a little bit better talking about this stuff than, again, the just totally infuriating uh, federal government just throwing its hands in the air. But on that note of a little bit more hopeful or inspiring things, I want to end this video, and this probably will be the last video of 2021 on the channel. Uh, I'll be going back to the audiobooks sometime early in January, but I may take a week or so off. I don't know. Anyway, 
there's a lot of stuff that was going around on Twitter, which I personally found encouraging. And if you're not on Twitter, that's fine. If you are on Twitter, come follow at socialism S four a, um, I think there's a pretty good feed going on and you can interact with some interesting people you might not have met otherwise, but I've seen a lot of stuff on Twitter, which is encouraging to me, just finding other people who have similar takes on this kind of stuff and regaining some sanity. So there is a super old video, probably not a lot of people are going to know this reference, but it's called Classical Gas. It's a song and they made a film, I want to say like in the late 60s, uh, some maybe sometime in the 70s, where they took like thousands of pieces of art and then did them like in super rapid fashion with this song. Uh, basically, I was seeing so many, so many witty and useful jokes against the CDC. I started thinking like you could almost do classical gas, but with these CDC jokes. I don't have quite as many as, uh, you know, they put into the original classical gas video. But I thought it would just be kind of uh, a lighter note, a high note maybe to end on to see uh, some other people's takes on this stuff. And end with a somewhat corny but somewhat uplifting song as well. I'm going to thank the patrons now rather than at the end, as I usually do. Uh, if you'd like to get your name on the screen, as theirs are, head to patreon.com slash socialism for all. Everybody, it's been a great year learning with you, getting to know you, watching this channel and this community grow and expand. That's been really exciting, fascinating, and encouraging. And I plan to keep that coming through 2022 and beyond. I probably have two or three years worth of content currently that's ready to go. <laughs> I just need the time to do it. So there will be more S4A. And uh, again, just thanks for all your contributions. It's been really nice running this channel. I learn a lot from it. And hopefully this is something that is going to help us collectively to improve the socialist movement, to expand the organizations, parties, and groups that are out there, whether it's mutual aid or it's a communist party, whatever it is, get involved, find something in your area, or at least make a contribution to them if you're not ready to join uh, or start a project of your own. There's a tremendous amount of really good stuff going on out there. Get involved in something. You will meet other people. You will do interesting work. And when the time is right, we can then take these organizations to the next level for more and more confrontations with capital in pursuit of socialism. And in the meantime, we're really going to have to help each other out because I do think there's going to be a lot of struggles coming up. But at the same time, if we apply ourselves and act in solidarity and fight for the movement and fight for our collective future, there's every reason to believe that we can win and keep on fighting until capitalism is completely gone from the face of the earth. On that note, Happy New Year, comrades, and take some time to enjoy your wins.